Good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be asked to give the Wernth Vernon War Lecture. I've recently retired from the IOE and one of the sort of activities one has to engage in is clearing out one's room and in my case that's a room that's been inhabited for many many years. And in the course of that one thing I came across was um, a whole set of hard copy set of um, Vernon War Lectures going back way back. David Hargreaves, Neville Bennett, and so on. And it was um, very interesting reading through um, these, uh, these lectures sort of much further on. Um, I'm quite aware of the Vernon Wall lectures, not least because I worked with Hazel Francis at the IOE, who had a lot to do with the origins of the Vernon Wall lectures. And it made me aware of Philip Vernon and Bill Wall, um, and so, it's, uh, as I say, it's a great pleasure to be asked to kind of contribute to this rather wonderful series. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have recognised that the title on the slide on the screen is not the title, quite the title, that I gave way back, because we missed a year, so this is going back over two years now. Um, I'll explain the change in the title in the course of the talk. But what I am hoping to do is to introduce what I think is a new approach to thinking about learning in classrooms. And I take a lot of the focus in educational research, psychological research connected to education and policy to be very, very occupied with how well educational approaches and interventions work in terms of academic attainment, so in terms of pupil outcomes. Um, to that, one might add uh, the more recent concern with kind of aspects of student learning over and above their attainment. So what some have called 21st century skills like creativity, critical thinking and so on. But as John Hattie reminded us in the 2014 Vernon Wall Lecture, the 21st century framework is silent on the means by which these desired skills now perhaps can or should be taught. It promotes no particular learning or teaching strategies. Uh, he's quoting Guy Claxton uh, in, that, uh, in that quote. In any case, in thinking about learning in schools, and in terms of the work that I've been done in, I've done in recent years, I've been reviewing the common explanations for learning in schools, and I've listed on that slide some of the most common that one finds. So things to do with teaching approaches and quality, things to do with school effectiveness. A lot when it comes from psychology, obviously, on within child factors. So cognitive development, intelligence, motivation, so on and so on. So they're within child factors. But then conversely, there's a lot of consideration, particularly by government, in terms of curriculum and assessment requirements. Or recently, one might add, initial teacher education which are supposed to be factors affecting pupil learning in some way, presumably. And then we've got a whole raft of sociological explanations in terms of both sort of demographic factors, but also more sociological um, kind of um, concepts like power and control and control. But just to, without going into all of those in any depth, which I haven't got time to do, in my view, these are not sufficient to account for learning in classrooms because they're not directly about pupils' immediate classroom experience. They're one step removed from the classroom context and the relationships within which and through which pupils are taught and learn. And that, in a nutshell, is the nub of where I'm sort of entering this whole um, issue. And what I'm gonna be doing is advancing what I call an eco-relational approach to learning in classrooms. And I'm gonna argue that in contrast to so much in educational research, it seems to me, and maybe psychological research as well in, the, in relation to education. What we seem to have lost is an attention to the close observation of classroom life. And in particular, close observation that recognizes two main things, the classroom context within which learning takes place, and then the relational aspects of classrooms. Um, obviously teacher-pupil interactions and relationships, but also pupil-pupil interactions and relationships. And my view is that without an understanding of these two kind of key features, which are rather downplayed, I think, in much educational work, 
pedagogy can be ineffective, and indeed it can even have a negative impact. But moreover, an attention to those, these two factors needs to provide the basis for, for change, really, realising, rather grandly, I put it here, realising the pedagogical potential of classroom learning. Um, what I'm going to be building on are the earlier papers that we have done on what we call social pedagogy. Uh, I've moved from the idea of social pedagogy for but the main reason is it doesn't quite capture this idea of the ecological context and the relational. So instead of social pedagogy, I've replaced it with eco-relational. Um, and I'll also, it's also got roots in my reading of Roger Barker's Ecological Psychology, which I'll come to in a moment. Other works are listed there. I had a three-year um, major research fellowship quite recently from Leverkusen, which allowed me to do something which many academics will agree is hard to do, which is basically read. And I've been reading a lot of stuff um, and building on that and going back to early social psych and philosophy in particular. Um, and the aim of all this is to integrate 30 years plus research at the, U at the UCL IOE on these research projects uh, as a rather busy slide, I apologise for that, but it, rather, it just summarises the work that I'm going to be drawing on. I'm not going to go through it in great detail. There's the work I've done with uh, Peter Cutnick and Ed Baines on uh, grouping practices and group work. Um, the, it's full of acronyms. The acronyms of the various projects are listed there, which I'll refer to later on. Uh, a major study of class size difference. I mean, was it major? It was a very large scale study involving lots and lots of kids and schools. Um, the Caspar study, the DIS study, the Deployment and Impact of Support Staff study, which was looking at support staff in schools, but uh, is the largest study worldwide, we argue, for teaching assistance. And then finally, two studies concerned with the education of children, educational needs and disabilities in mainstream schools, master centre. Right, in this presentation, I'm going to be doing four things. I'm going to give some background to conceiving classroom context and relational aspects of, of classrooms. Um, really sharing with you some of my reading on this topic, or these topics even. I'm going to try and explain this eco-relational approach that I'm um, developing. I'm then going to apply it to our research on within class groupings, class size, and the education of pupils with SEND. And then I'm going to look at one study we've done, which I think best expresses the pedagogical potential in the classroom context, following the, the sort of framework I've been I'm developing. So moving on to the first of these, conceiving classroom context. Well, in the course of the major research fellowship, I've been I had great pleasure in going back to a lot of um, kind of different approaches which have some bearing on the whole idea of context. Cognitive development, obviously in Piaget and Vygotsky and later developments post uh, Vygotsky and developments, sociological approaches, various models of classroom contexts, quite formally put, Duncan and Biddle, Lewis, Fraser and um, Piantis work on the class framework. Um, oddly somewhat neglected in a way when thinking about classrooms is the most, in the sense, one of the most obvious, which is, which from my relatively cursory reading doesn't have much to say about schools actually, but could do. Um, there's a lot of work in applied developmental science recently, including uh, Linda Darling Hammond and her colleagues, which is relevant to contexts. And of course, I say of course because it seems to me to have the most direct connection with thinking about contexts is social science. But all of these, in ways that I haven't got time to explain, <laughs> seem to me not to capture the independent qualities and contributions of the proximal context within which pupils learn. So a little bit more on classroom context. Our usual way of thinking about them is in terms of teachers affecting pupil learning or attainment. It's kind of an implicit assumption, it's rather one way. But one starting point from the work I'm doing is that it's actually teachers and pupils both adapting to demands of the classroom environment. So it's not like an independent variable and outcome so much as both pupils and teachers are responding to the classroom environment. But Saying the classroom context is important is only one, it's just the start really. We need to work through what are the specific elements which are likely to facilitate or hinder teaching and learning. Hamre and Pianta have got some quite interesting things to say about classroom context, which I think, although I'm, I'm going a bit away from their views about um, 
about how the classroom context works, they do say three things, which I think are very relevant. They argue that effects of settings on development are driven by proximal processes more than distant processes. That's the Bronk and Brenner idea. So the day-to-day -day experiences in classroom. And these constitute the majority of school-based proximal processes. They also argue that the classroom is, from a developmental psychology point of view, is actually an incredibly rich context uh, in which to study basic developmental process. There's a nice quote from Pianta Pian there. The study of development in classrooms offers as much for developmental theory as it does for educational practice. And then finally, and this is something which I'll come back to at various points, um, what goes on in classrooms is often about different kinds of educational interventions, quite obviously, but they won't be successful if they don't take account of how classroom processes and interactions mediate those interventions. So three good points, I think, from Hammer and Pianta about classroom context. The main um, reference point for me and I've become increasingly interested is the whole area of ecological psychology, much neglected, I think, in psychology, the whole range of things, uh, reasons. There's a lovely book by um, Harry Heft, which um, goes into the origins of ecological psychology back to William James and what he sees as radical empiricism. I'd love to spend a lot of time on that. I think it's really very interesting philosophical issue that a lot of psychology are uh, touched on. I mean, and Hef's, one of Hef's main points is that psychology has been traditionally much preoccupied and still is with individual subjectivity, but rarely with what he thinks is the underappreciated role of the environment in behaviour and development. And he draws on the work of both Gibson and Barker to, to develop that idea. Philosophically, the roots are, as Hef sees it, that psychology implicitly has been very much driven by a mind, sort of body and environment split. Seavers of the world. Um, and from Hef's point of view, there's a philosophical problem with all of that. Uh, there's a nice quote here. It's mischievous from a psychological perspective to talk loosely about factors in the environment and factors in the person. Um, and this last sentence of that quote is really neat, rather neat, I think. Recognising that patterns of action are co-determined through multiple mutual influences and constraints renders the inside-outside distinction meaningless. I mean, the basic underlying point, and rather crudely put, is that the environment has meaning. It's not something that we impose meaning on. Um, the precursor of Roger Barker is Kurt Lewin, uh, like so much of American social psych, a refugee from Europe. And um, Bronfenbrenner, who is influenced by ecological psychology, says that um, one unorthodox aspect of Lewin's schema is his treatment of motivational forces. I'll let you read the quote, but the basic point is that, as it were, the motivation for, for people in environments comes from that environment. Um, Lewin is, was much, I've been reading quite a bit of Kurt Lewin recently, and he's much preoccupied with kind of sort of physical and maths, physical and mathematics. Physics and mathematics is a way of capturing psychological processes, which is taking it a bit far in a way from my reading, but you can see the point there. And another founding father of social psych, um, Solomon Ash. One of the most important tasks of the psychologist is to study how stubborn environmental facts act upon and alter the behavior of persons. For example, the ubiquitous coercive behaviour settings of students in high schools and have it. Well, the task for us, well, for me, really, <laughs> is to understand these stubborn environmental facts when it comes to the classroom context. OK, environmental psychology more directly. Uh, William James, Kurt Lewin, as I've said, his idea of life spaces. And there's a whole very rich um, social psychological history there. There. They championed the idea of moving away from, they argued that psychology rather too quickly moved into a predominantly experimental study. And that what, what psychology, pretty much alone among sciences, tended to um, neglect was the basic observational, descriptive, natural history stage of many other sciences. So a lot of what they did was to observe the naturalistic observations of individual children over the course of their school day. Um, well, their, their whole day. I mean, there's a lot I could say about this, but I wanted to pick, pick out one key idea in ecological psychology is this idea of a discrete, immediate, supra-individual unit. 
uh, Barker cool behaviour setting, which is a region within, within which daily life takes place, which is distinct and influences actions of people in it. And he argued that you can predict more about, and he arrived at this conclusion from many, many hours poring over the data, to argue that you can learn more about kids from the situation and the settings within which they're sort of they're in than about the behavior tendencies of individual kids so it's about as it were that basic social psychological point it's about the situation as much as the individual child but there's some limitations which is where i've sort of taken my point of departure there's the fairly obvious constructivist subjectivities critique which is a bit more complicated i think than is that than might be obviously felt but one might argue, um, from the point of view of classrooms, the role of practitioners in all of this. I think there's a general sense in which um, social relationships in classrooms are slightly underplayed in ecological psychology. There's little, actually, although there was some work in schools by Paul Gump and others, little on pedagogy. And in terms of the, the, the key kind of the Barker um, units, this behaviour setting unit, it's defined in terms of interconnectedness and you, it's defined quite precisely, but the specific nature of those interconnections within a given behaviour setting seem to me to be important. And it's quite from the behaviour setting point of view, coming from Barker, to account for differences between classrooms and how effective they are. So a key point for me is how the behaviour setting interconnects and aligns with pedagogical intention. And then the second key dimension I mentioned, I, cited earlier on from my approach is the relation. Some general points about relations in that slide. Uh, there's a quote from Fogel, who is one of the people who's contributed to ecolog ecological psychology, uh, which I mean, without reading it out, it's fairly clear it has a fundamental role uh, relationships have. You can see the development of understanding relationships in developmental psychology, uh, and developmental science, Linda Darling Hammond and Osher and other people in recent um, in recent uh, journal papers. There's two fairly obvious relationships in the school context, the teacher pupil and the pupil pupil. Much of that literature I'm going to argue is about and attending to the, as it were, the quality of the relationships and the effects that has. But there's little, I argue, on the structural and interactive properties of the classroom context. Um, now, there's a lot of work undertaken to encapsulate in that slide, and I apologise for it being rather busy, but it's my understanding of my reading of the literature on teacher people interactions and uh, relationships. There's a long tradition of descriptive research, which I applaud, but it's rather thin on the ground these days. A lot of work when it comes to effectiveness in teaching, from a quantitative point of view and maybe a psychological point of view, in terms of general domains of teaching and then specific instructional strategies. I was at the early conference uh, in Arkham uh, 2019 and it was interesting to me how much psychology has been directed at rather specific instructional strategies and you can see I've listed some of the more obvious ones there. Um, there's also a, a sort of rather separate educational psychology literature on the importance of teacher people relationships and again Emre and Pianta and Wugel's um, from Holland and other people have had a lot to, to, to do. Um, but there's also, I think, a rather limited literature, but some, on, as it were, teaching support for learning. So kids who are struggling in schools for various reasons and what teaching approaches are relevant for that. But in one slide, um, to summarise my reading of that literature, again, most research assumes a one-way linear effect. Most research is critical of typical forms of teacher to pupil classroom interaction. So the general view amongst uh, many, many folks is that the transmission model of teaching um, is inappropriate, students are too passive. And what is often championed is teaching for understanding and thinking. But interestingly, it's, often, it's also commonly recognized that it's actually quite hard to do and it's not common. The kind of teaching we propose is not easy to do. Why is that? Well, one reason may be because we pay little, too little attention to the proximal classroom context and processes through which teaching takes place. And then the second sort of part of the relational um, component is to do with peer relations in schools. Now, again, there's a lot I could say about this, and the colleagues we spent a lot of time on this. 
I think one can say that peer relations are often taken for granted in schools and actually treated as a problem, which is kind of reinforced by a lot of developmental psychology, which has been concerned with bullying and so on. A lot of the psychological literature we've looked at in relation to peer relations examines associations between measures of peer relations, for example, social status and pupil outcomes. Um, but I argue with colleagues that far from being insignificant or a problem to be solved, peer relations in school are pretty critical to learning. Um, peer relations filter what the teacher is saying to the pupils in a pretty fundamental way, as Graham Luffell um, pointed out. A teacher, sorry, the, the, the other, other children in the class are a valuable information source. They're critical for collaborative group work, peer relations, in ways that I'll come to. And the general idea that we're talking about the value of a symmetric uh, relationship as opposed to an asymmetric relationship. So something, something horizontally organized rather than vertically organized expert to novice. My general conclusions on the cycle of research on peer relations reviews that we've done are that it's wonderfully, uh, it's very insightful work, but there's few insights, I think, in, on teaching, learning and pedagogy. Um, there's little on the everyday interaction of relationships through which psychological constructs like social status and so on are enacted, which most directly influence children. Uh, as uh, Thomas Kinderman um, said, we need studies that focus on specific interactional mechanisms through which peers exert influences in the real world. And to going back to my theme of context, there's little on the role of proximal classroom context in everyday peer relations of working together. For example, in the case of um, working together productively on school work, on, for example, the characteristics of groupings within classrooms. So there we are. I've covered some of the ground. Um, I've had a bit of fun reading around all of those things over the last three years or so. So to sum it up, my uh, approach to um, learning in classrooms is encapsulated in those three headings, the contextual, particularly the immediate micro classroom context and how things are interconnected within that, and the relational. And I'll say a little bit about how I've gone a bit beyond just teaching people and people pupil interactions when thinking about the relational. And then the third kind of area is the pedagogical alignment of all the processes within classrooms. So I'm just going to quickly talk about those three before I seek to apply this to our research. So when it comes to the first of those, the immediate micro classroom context. So I'm very much persuaded by ecological psychology um, with the proviso or the rather the caveat that I'm not so persuaded by the behavior setting um, sort of unit of analysis. But I am very persuaded that in order to get a handle on what's going on in classrooms, we need attention to the proximal immediate classroom micro context. Um, and to, to go back to this point that the environment has meaning, uh, Walter Doyle has said that something rather neat, which is that the environment has plans for the inhabitants. We need to look closely at the micro context to understand, as it were, what those plans are. But also, again, derived from eco ecological psychology, that what we're talking about here is not linear effects of one thing on, a, on another, but a system which is interconnected. So the elements within classrooms are interconnected. Some, in the book I did recently with Tony Russell, we argued thinking about class size on its own is, is really about the fallacy of the single cause and that the classroom is best considered as a dynamic, interconnected and multifaceted system. It's complicated, but unless we get a handle on that, we're not going to be very wise in our recommendations to teachers at school. Um, and, the, and the interconnections at any given moment in time are at the heart of pedagogy as experienced by pupils. That's the kind of key point. If we want to get at what pedagogy means for individual pupils, we look at what it means in everyday, moment by moment classroom experiences. And it's when we look at that, we can see how learning is facilitated or inhibited. And then on the relational, well, teacher pupil, pupil pupil interactions and relationships, yes, as in the ways that I've described. But what we need to go further, I think, we need to identify which features of relationships are important in teaching and learning. So it's not just about the importance of teacher people relationships and how they lead to better outcomes or not, but what aspects of teacher people relationships and people people relationships help to facilitate learning, for example, in collaborative group work. And I think this is important because whilst we accept 
fairly obvious thing that teachers need to be interventionists when it comes to academic matters. That's kind of the nature of their job, isn't it? But I think we need to extend this to social relationships that underpin learning. We need to be wise about what aspects of classroom relationships help. Um, and I mentioned in the bottom bullet point of that slide, collaborative group work. But I'll come back. I'll come to that um, um, shortly. In terms of kind of giving expression to this idea of what relational features are helpful to aid working together. And then the final third point of this eco relational approach is what I call pedagogical alignment. So we need to consider not just that things are interconnected, but the type of interconnection. So it's the, it's the nature of interconnectedness, how the constituent elements are aligned or not, which is critical. And a kind of a key driving kind of point is pedagogy, which needs to inform that analysis of interconnectedness, because pedagogy is what gives direction and purpose to the classroom environment, which I think, and that idea of Pedagogy is missing from a lot of work I see on classroom interactions. Um, so an important dynamic comes from the alignment or not between pedagogical intention of teachers. Um, what the observational research, some of which we've contributed to, shows that adaptations made by teachers are not always for the best. So that's a summary of what I'm arguing. An approach is needed in which essential elements of teach people, people, people interactions and relationships, concepts and pedagogy come together in a dynamic and interconnected framework. We need to think strategically about aspects of classroom context and relationships conducive to teaching and learning. And we need to do this because it's sort of engaging in educational interventions, for example, from meta-analyses that I won't mention, which we're often advised we need to choose the kind of things that really work. They won't work if we don't pay attention to the classroom context and the relationships within classroom. Right. So the next stage of this talk is to apply this to um, our research. And one to think about one um, methodology that we've used, which I think is quite neat because it does help to capture this idea of the immediate proximal micro context within which learning takes place. And this is it's a really simple approach um, of the classroom map, which we've used in our within class grouping work. Um, with a thanks to Peter Kutnick, who's collaborated on a lot of this work, he originally saw it as some kind of phenomenon graph, phenomenon graph um, which I haven't said correctly, and I apologize for that. The idea that you're capturing a moment in time um, so a description of what takes place within classrooms so we can, one can see the basis for change. And from a research point of view, if one can get enough of these maps, one can build up a, a very neat um, account of social context and conditions for learning across many, many classrooms, which is what we did. So what we did was to ask teachers to, at a given point in the day, to complete a number of bits of information on a pre-drawn map of their classroom where people were, what groupings they were part of, curriculum tasks, the type of working interaction and the location of adults. And it's used in, and you can see the acronyms of the appendix at the bottom of that slide. Within class groupings work, um, we used it in the um, class size project. And here's a classroom map, um, which colleagues will recognize. And you can see quite clearly from that, the groupings, the constitution of the groups, the composition of the groups even, in terms of gender, the tasks of the groups, the curriculum area of the groups, where the adults are sat, and note one adult is sat outside with a child, uh, engaged in pretty basic work in English. Then you see lots of things, um, you can go beyond that, but that's kind of some basic stuff, and that slide just says what I've said. I think. And you can go beyond it, as it says in the bottom point of that bullet. So I'm going to use the classroom map findings to um, draw out some of the issues when it comes to um, what's going on in classrooms that are revealed by this particular approach and by ego. And, um, I apologise that this talk's got reference in lots and lots of studies, of which, about which I can't say very much for the time that we've got. 
But this is a lot of work that we've done on within class groupings in classrooms, which are very common, as we know, in, in Britain. There's little systematic knowledge about the characteristics of groups on the ground was the starting point of this work. So we were seeking to describe as a fairly low level, but quite useful research um, sort of purpose to understand what was going on on the ground moment by moment in terms of group size, composition, role of adults and tasks. Um, and you've got some facts and figures at the bottom there of the numbers of these groupings. We see a fairly sizable amount and some references to where you can find that work. So I've got one slide for this work, which is was hard won actually, this slide, <laughs> in terms of summarizing um, the amazing amount of work that went into dealing with all these interconnections. Um, as colleagues, particularly Ed Baines, will uh, well, I was going to say fondly, but maybe not fondly, uh, remember. So here's, that, here's some summary points. In general, there's a lack of alignment between a number of aspects of classroom groupings. So group size and tasks, the group size and the type of interaction, not always in alignment in productive way. That the classroom conditions and seating arrangements um, are mostly, it seems, about classroom management and control rather than pedagogy. So obviously, from a number of people, Morris Gordon have commented on this, people sat in groups but mostly working as individuals. That practitioner pedagogical preferences can be out of alignment with the group of practice. So teachers often tell us the key driving pedagogical sort of point for them is about individual attention, uh, but they set the class up into, into, into groups and they don't necessarily use the groups effectively for individual attention. Um, the collaborative group work uh, seating arrangements may not facilitate group work. Kids may not really be doing very much group work, even though they're sat in groups. A number of resistances to collaborative group work from practitioners and uh, pupils come to that. And that pupils, sorry, uh, adults, teachers and teaching assistants who shouldn't be neglected here do not always facilitate psychology work in groups. So some summary points of our work on within class groupings, which indicate from an eco-relational point of view, there's things to deal with. And there's two summary points of what I've just said. I don't think I need to go over those. I think I've captured that in what I said already. I'm going to now move to the second of three areas of research to draw out these eco-relational points. And this is our work on class size. Anyone's interested in this, you can go to the book I did recently with uh, Tony Russell, 2020, which you can download for free from the UCL website. Um, so, I mean, at the risk of telling people something people know very well, there's a long-standing debate about class size. There's commonly a debate between those that argue better for teaching and learning, those that argue that it's really quite trivial. Most research looks at class size in relation to pupil attainment, um, and a number of various meta-analyses argue that that shows the class size effects are trivial. But we argue, actually, when you look at it, there's few studies of class size in relation to classroom processes. So I'm going to show you one slide, which is really captures, again, a hard one from all the work we've done using systematic observations, using case studies, using national teacher questionnaires, open-ended and closed responses, all analysed and sort of integrated. These are the factors which appear to be connected to large classes, often recognize that large classes are a bit of a pain, but not, as it were, the details on it. So I'm just going to um, highlight a couple of those points. Definitely clear from systematic observation, there's less individual attention and less active participation by pupils in large classes, something teachers would, um, are worried about. Um, differentiation is harder, which is kind of a similar sort of point to make. So if you've got some children in the class that you need to pay attention to, it's much more difficult than a large class. Um, there's fewer sort of opportunities for assessing the work that children are doing, less individual knowledge about individual pupils. Um, and there's more reliance on teaching assistants for children who need extra support. So there's a long list there. Um, and you might add to that the one at the bottom one, which is the effects on teachers themselves in terms of stress, workflows and tiredness, which may be in the end one of the most uh, important side effects of large classes. So these are some summary points of our work on class sizes. When you look in detail at what's going on, there is an issue about large classes. 
the classroom context when it comes to um, class size is terribly important in uh, a number of different ways. And to pick up a point about this, but also within class groupings, it means that we need to adapt our teaching to make the most of small class classes. You know, we can go on just kind of putting up with it, or we can think strategically about how we deal with it. And then lastly, the last area of research is to do with um, special educational needs and classroom context. And again, there's a kind of a lot of background I could go into in terms of this work. It's the work I did with Rob Webster, funded by the Nothing Foundation, the Master in the Sense projects, based on the idea that there's a, an increase in recognition of the numbers of kids with SEND in mainstream schools. There's often a, a look at the kind of nature of the teaching methods and the curriculum and the nature of uh, kids' special needs and disabilities. But we argue it's also important to know about the classroom context within which those children are educated, which can serve to inhabit pedagogical intentions and support, inhibit rather. So in a way, put it rather crudely, it's important to examine inclusion policies on the ground. And again, there's some facts and figures there. Uh, and by the way, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into these classroom observation studies. If you add them all up, there's going over 200,000 observation points, I think. Um, and there's 70,000 in their master and sense studies on their own. And we've written all this stuff up in various journal papers. And again, one slide to summarize this work. So when you look at classrooms in detail, on the ground, moment by moment, you discover a number of things. Um, unusually, in the UK, class sizes are, are, more, are bigger at primary rather than secondary. Again, we take it for granted, but actually it's pretty unique across the world. And it's pretty obviously difficult to provide individual support and differentiation for pupils with SEND. Large classes cause severe problems for inclusion. Again, we sort of take it for granted, but the problem is in terms of the, as it were, the, e the eco-relational, the eco, eco uh, in this case. Um, pupils with SEND almost always taught in homogeneous groups. So although they're in a classroom in mainstream schools, they're almost always separated in terms of the groups they're working. So at primary, that's a within class low attainment group, sometimes taken out, in fact, quite a lot of times taken out of the classroom with various kinds of interventions, but separated from their peers by the nature of the group they're sat in. At secondary, it's much more severe where there are children um, with SEND are typically in sets with other pupils with SEND or low attaining pupils, which we argue, uh, Rob Webster and I have argued, is, is a kind of a form of streaming in a way. It's not that the whole class is streamed from the, from the outset. Uh, in the way that I had when I was at school back in the 50s and 60s. Um, but it's effectively a formal streaming because they spend almost all their time on with other children of similar attainment levels and similar SEND. Um, and also there's a high reliance on one-to-one -one TA support and out-of-class interventions. Pupils with SENDs have less time with teachers relative to other pupils and also quite markedly less time with their peers. So all of these facts have come to us through close observation of what goes on in the classroom. So a couple of summary points again. So there's a separation of pupils with SCND and the classroom context, including class size and within class groupings affects inclusion, but rarely considered. So it's the kind of the nature of the context within classrooms that are important. So here's a summary of where we've got to with the eco-relational approach when applied to the big research projects that we've done. Interconnectedness of classroom elements not always best aligned pedagogically. We've seen that in our work on within class groupings, class size and SEND. And we need to therefore think strategically how to make the most pedagogically of the alignment of the elements within classrooms. And I think that means we move to the last bit of this talk, which is about what we do about it. So in a sense, I've outlined the problem drawing on these studies. Now I'm going to look at one approach using the eco-relational idea to see how we can improve things pedagogically. And it's the case of group work, and in particular our study that was funded by ESRC as part of the Teaching and Learning Research Programme, the SPRING project, which I did with uh, Peter Cutney and Maurice Gordon 
and Ed Baines again was was um, heavily involved in that work. So for recognition across the world that students not only need to acquire knowledge but also the desire and the skills to work together. These are starting points in, as it were, an appreciation of the importance of group work. There's a lot of psychological theory that you can apply to um, collaboration with peers. It's a powerful force, conceptual development, active learning and communication. A lot of that is reviewed in the book I did with Peter Cutler. Um, drawing on a whole raft of different psychological uh, approaches, including Piaget. Um, and more prosaically, the way in which collaborative learning is comes out as being quite effective in the various meta-analyses of effective interventions, including the one by John Hattie. Rather nice paper by uh, Bill Damon and Feltz, um, 89, on the value of collaborative root work, which I think kind of, in a way, captures our views about it. Um, I'm not going to read those out, I'm just going to leave those for you to have a look at. But very valuable in terms of conceptual development. This up the bottom one, fellow explorers, not isolated incompetence. I think is a really rather neat way of expressing it. So the spring project, just concluding collaborative group work is a is is kind of good, is not enough. And we've learned the hard way, really. You can't just put children together and assume it will work. So you can say that collaborative group work is good, but if you put kids together and hope it works, it simply won't, for reasons that we um what we'll explain. You need to develop the conditions needed for high quality group work. You need to come at it from the point of view of the, as it were, the ecology of the classroom, but also the relationships within the classroom. So it's not just about collaborative group work as a general intervention, but the type of approach adopted. So there's a bit of background about the spring project. Um, I wish I could go into that in more detail, but um, I think that captures most of the points. It was a study, I think it was a four year study, in which we set out to develop an approach to collaborative group work by very extensive uh, collaboration with teachers and schools. And then we, in a, only not just as a, a, a short term evaluation, the long term, year long evaluation of how it worked in primary schools, key stage one, key stage two, <coughs> excuse me, and also into secondary schools. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a call like a wolf. You can see a summary of this work in the Catholic and Blanche report, also a paper by, um, um, Ed, sorry, not a paper, it's actually the, um, the, the, the guidance for teachers that arose out of this work, which was published in 2016, the second edition of that. So we developed specific strategies for high quality group work. And I would argue we did that from an eco-relational point of view. I don't think it was explicit, so explicit back in the early days, but it's become very apparent to me that we were doing this. And then picking up on the, the key areas of an eco-relational approach I have done already, there were two kind of main dimensions in this work. The first was preparing the classroom context for group work. In terms of the classroom seating, quite commonly we found this was Lip service was paid to it, but it's critical in terms of the success of the group. So you've got to think about how, where kids are sat in relation to each other. You've got to think about the size of the group. There's not much point in doing sixes and sevens in the group if you want to have effective group work. Um, the stability of groups over time don't allow groups to be dissolved and kids to move on on the basis of conflict. We're not, don't do it very easily because that will just get you nowhere. And think about the stability of groups, the composition of the groups, lots of um, points that come from that in terms of mixing attainment and gender and then the tasks that kids are engaged in within the groups are very very important you can see this as a kind of a contextual aspect i think um, you need tasks that warrant uh, group working and the nature of the kind of output is important as well we've seen on many occasions the way it doesn't work very well for example if people have got multiple outcomes to uh, outputs to produce on the basis of group work so that's the first sort of area is to do with the context. Second is to do with the idea of the relational, and there's two parts to that. The first is with adults, um, and there's some kind of points that we uh, amplify in the, the guidance uh, for teachers. The different way of thinking about the role of the teacher and the TA when it comes to groups. 
perhaps to other forms of, um, of instruction within classrooms. So the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage is the kind of idea. So ways of supporting lessons, help in support in, in observing what's going on, which, act, which can feed into the support. Um, also important to make sure that TAs who often have a lot to do with, perhaps ironically, the, the groups who are more hard to teach, they need to think very strategically about the ways in which teaching assistants uh, work with groups. But perhaps most importantly, it's to do with the relational approach with regard to the skills that pupils have to work together. And we've learned, I think, very fundamentally, we need to think these group work skills right through in order to arrive at high quality group work. So the first area is about enabling children to work constructively together. It's not about, in a sense, it's not about skills. It's about much more fundamental dispositions. So the development of trust and ways of dealing with conflict. Basic communication skills, such as taking turns, active listening, giving and asking for help. And then the more advanced group working skills, such as making group decisions, compromises, and coming to a consensus. So there's a developmental sequence, which is very important that we work through. So there is the problems identified from an eco-relational point of view, and one way in which we can seek to use the eco-relational approach to develop high quality teaching in a way. So just to end, um, we need to, well, I need to keep thinking about how you apply this approach. Um, and I have been doing some of this actually when it comes to, for example, class size and special educational needs, and I haven't got time to go into those, but we've been working on that. Um, and another kind of, and this has become very apparent, hasn't it, during the pandemic, other contexts for learning apart from classrooms. I used to worry that this might mean, that given that how many kids are learning in schools rather than, sorry, at home rather than schools, that maybe the school is less important. But it just, for me, amplifies the point that we need to know really quite a lot. In fact, it's crying out, it seems to me, to be done, to learn more about learning in homes from an eco-relational point of view. How does it work? We have very little information at this point. You know, how many kids are and we know they've been struggling, but in what ways? And this is um, from a, a talk I gave to folks in New Zealand where modern innovative learning environments are very big. So I suppose in terms of the British context, open plan schooling, um, and I was asked if that makes the class size issue less important. Well, we still need close observation of pedagogical experience of individual pupils. So thank you very much.